Hey folks, welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, Season 2, Episode 13. We'll kick it off here momentarily. If you're just joining, let us know where you are joining from, watching the show from. According to our stats here, nobody's watching yet though, so I'm really just talking to myself. <laughs> I haven't gotten the update or the notification yet. <laughs> I got it, it came through... Uh, According to my phone, 16 seconds ago. <laughs> Facebook is really weird how it rolls out notifications. Mm-hmm. Hey, Gary and John, thank you for joining, gentlemen. Good to have you with us. Oh, we got Father's Day coming up here. So before we forget, happy Father's Day to all you out there. You as well, man. Um, hopefully all of you are good fathers. Because if you're not, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important role, man. It's the yeah. biggest thing, right? Yep. Hey, Wes, thanks for watching. Hopper, Casey, John, normally from Oklahoma, but watching today from Florida. Cool, buddy. I uh, hope the weather is nice down there. Or are they getting the same heat wave that a lot of the other country, rest of the country is getting? I don't know. What, what's it like there for you in Ohio, Matthew? Actually, today was not too bad. I mean, it, it's been relatively eight, you know, 80s, 70s. Um, not a lot of humidity yet, so I'm enjoying it. We got cicadas all over the place, but mm -hmm. other than that, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're in our third day of like 100 degree plus weather here in the oh. Denver area. Yeah. Um, whether they actually have recorded that or not, I mean, our we have a like a mini weather station in our house here, and it's been at least at a hundred or over a hundred every day this week. So that's and that's very unusual for middle of June. Hmm. Like normally, that's like late July temperature. You know, in the August even we'll see stuff like that. But uh, so yeah, it's like wow, like where'd this come from? Because last week was quite nice. You know, a week ago today was like mid 80s like cool all right I'll take that and then you know we got slammed and uh you know hopper here, here is talking about traveling to texas and i know texas really really hot like to the point that they're instituting uh electrical you know rationing mm -hmm. and encouraging you know people to use less elect electricity and like i get that because you can overwhelm the grid and that's going to be worse for everybody, but at the same time, like, you know, it's tough. Like, you know, you either need the electricity or you don't. So uh, the big thing is obviously running all the air conditioners. <laughs> Steve from Alaska. Yeah, I'll bet it's not too bad up there. Very nice. Hey, Mark. Hey, Wes. Hope I get a shot timer for Father's Day. Well, was it on your list? I hope so. Do we make Father's Day lists? I don't yeah, think we made a list. We should start. Saying, like maybe he had a list. That's for, a good idea. Yeah, it is a good idea. Mm -hmm. A little late for it now, though. <laughs> uh, 96 and 100% humidity in Georgia. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> for Mark in California, been over 100 all week. Yep, yep. Mitch is watching. What's he doing? He's got other work to do. He's got family in Wasilla, huh? I didn't know that about Mitch. Maybe I did. I don't remember. Anyway, guys, let's get it going here. Let's get the show rocking and rolling. Uh, apologize for kicking off a little bit late here today. Just a little bit more prep behind the scenes than usual. Um, yeah, I hear you, Mark. At least it's a dry heat. Same here. Same here. You know, I, I actually went outside yesterday. And it was like 5, 530. It was, no, it's closer to 6 o'clock. It was still like 96 degrees. I'm standing at the grill, you know, grilling uh, burgers. And uh, I was like, you know what? Could be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> Certainly could be. Yeah. Mitch, watching and working. I was just teasing you. You're doing work. I know you are. So, all right, let's 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 get the uh, actual podcast rolling. Uh, so, you ready, Matthew? I am ready. All righty. In three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, Season 2, Episode 13. 
And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network, brought to you by Excess Sites. Today is Wednesday, June 16th, 2021, as of the recording of this show, and I am your host, Riley Bowman. Also joined today by Matthew Marister. I am here in the nick of time, man. <laughs> you know, I, I was just thinking as I was going through that, I mean, people maybe notice I'm reading more from our script than I used to. But that's because if I don't, I'll mess things up. We, you know, we have a title sponsor of the podcast, which is Excess Sites. I got to make sure I recognize them. Uh, you know, we go out, uh, we change the format from episode numbers to seasons and episodes numbers. And we start telling you when we record the show, uh, what day, so that when you're listening, you have a sense. Because like, I get the sense that sometimes listeners may listen to an episode many months later or even years later, and they're listening to us talk about some issue legally or legislatively that is no longer even relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's why we tell you when, when the show is recorded. But I was thinking as I was reading that, Matthew, about how like some podcasts will be like, and This is your host, Riley Bowman, competitive shooter, instructor, father of five, (laughs) you know, Matthew Marister, Marine, former law enforcement officer, all around great dude with a sexy beard. (laughs) (laughs) I'll go with that. I'll go with that. (laughs) Anyway, welcome, guys. Uh, Glad to be with you here today. This is actually our industry news and gear reviews episode. Once a month, we do th- this episode, this this format, if you will, where we share with you latest news from across the gun industry. We have a whole separate legislative news episode that covers more legislative matters. Today is more focused on industry matters, although you'll see that there's sometimes a little bit of crossover. Uh, for instance, today we're going to give you an update on the court case out of California. Uh, uh, the, um, um, what is it, Miller? Or, yes. Yeah, Miller versus Bont. Now it's Miller versus Bonta. Started out as Miller versus whoever Becerra. the former, yeah Becerra, the old or you know the the former Attorney General of California. Give you some updates on that case, uh, and there are updates even from the article that we are sharing with you today. There's been some some updates uh, very recently about that case. In other words, at this point, it's going for an on banc review of a full panel of eleven judges. Uh, which will be interesting to see how that shakes out because I've heard that the makeup of that of those judges is not quite as favorable, which is no surprise, honestly, coming out of the Ninth Circuit. When you get a larger panel of judges, uh, the makeup of that court is gonna it's gonna lean a little bit more towards uh, democratically appointed judges, which means for us in the Second Amendment side of things, less likely to. Uh, go our way on Second Amendment issues. But anyway, we're going to cover that, but we're going to cover a bunch of other industry news, including a couple of new gun releases, new guns that are going to hit the market or are hitting the market uh, pretty much right now or close to now. Uh, I know a lot of times these manufacturers, when they make these announcements, they try to have them already being shipped to dealers and or distributors and you know trying to go out the door pretty quickly. So you'll be seeing these uh, on shelves here pretty soon uh, if you're not already. <clears throat> also, uh, we got some other great news, but we have two gear reviews we'll share with you today. Matthew's got his pick and I've got mine. I'm actually quite excited to talk about mine. I'm, I was sitting here this morning thinking about what to do and had forgotten that I even you know had this, this particular item and, and have been using it quite a bit and enjoy it. But first, today's episode is sponsored and brought to you by CCW Safe. CCWSafe.com is their home as far as website is concerned. That is where I would go to check out their coverages. Whether you go with the Defender or Protector plans, which are their more basic plans geared to everyday. The Defender plan is a a concealed carrier's plan. The Protector plan is actually a special plan that's uh, available for law enforcement officers and military. There's also the Ultimate plan, which is what I have and I'm proud to have and proud to be a CCW Safe Ultimate member. Uh, Honestly, the Defender And protector plan coverage is really, really good. I think the best in the industry for that level of coverage, you know, for about that price point. But the ultimate plan, of course, is ultimate. So uh, anyway, guys, check out ccwsafe.com to learn more. 
if you want to look at our comparison guide available at concealedcarry.com forward slash insurance, you may do so and compare CCW safe against all the other players in the industry. Feel free to do that. You know, we worked hard to make that a, a very fact-based, straightforward, non-biased source of information which I know maybe sounds weird because here we are promoting CCW safe, but at the same time, that was our approach with that is looking at purely the coverages that are available and putting all those facts down on paper for you, or at least on your computer screen. But finally, if you decide CCW safe is the coverage for you, use coupon code CC podcast to save 10% off of your CCW safe membership and guardian nation members save double. So if you're not a Guardian Nation member, but you have been thinking about it, might be good timing to join Guardian Nation and also pick up a CCW Safe membership because you'll save 20% instead of 10%. But for podcast listeners only, you can use, or for you guys that are hearing this, you can use CC, CC Podcast to save 10%. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Ready Up Gear Range Ruck Backpack, uh, which is my uh, gear, my gear, What's what am I trying to say? Range bag, my range bag of choice. Uh, I use it on a weekly basis, sometimes multiple times in a week. If I'm going to the range multiple times, I just took a class over the weekend from a fantastic instructor here locally, uh, more of a competitive fo shooting focus class. And my range ruck backpacks right there with me on the range. And I actually, so interesting story, Matthew. Um, I, I keep meaning to tell this to the rest of the team, but I guess you're, you'll be the first to hear. It just keeps slipping my mind for whatever reason, even though it was kind of significant. But I did actually blow up a gun on Saturday. Hmm. Yeah. Not sure yet the cause for it. Uh, I find it hard to believe I double charged. These were reloads I was shooting. Okay. I find it hard to believe I double charged it because of my press setup. I've got a, a powder check in place. Uh, it's basically physically impossible for, for me to double charge a case of powder. Um, could be some other factor. You never know. So something that Grey Guns, who sponsors me as a competitive shooter, I've sent the gun already off to them, and they're going to be looking over and inspecting it and seeing if it's you know salvageable, which it looks like it is. Uh, basically just blew out the sides of the uh, grip module. Wow. Stung my hands and surprised me. Um, but uh, anyway... Where I'm going with that is I had my Ranger Ruck backpack with my spare gun in one of the little dividers in the big pocket because you can transport very easily and also safely and securely up to four handguns in the Ranger Ruck backpack. So I was like, it was no big deal. I was like, no, oh, all right. I mean, it was a big deal, but, <laughs> right, right, right. but you know, here I'm in a class and I, you know, when I, whether I go to a class, a training class or to a class I'm teaching or to a competitive match, uh, I always have a back, you know, a spare gun because we have to recognize the possibility that sort of thing can happen. Sure. And it was no big deal to just walk over to the safe area and open up my rain truck backpack and pull out my spare pistol and back after it in the class. So good thing you, uh, you didn't get injured or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I do feel fortunate in that regard. I, I have seen a num well, I'm, I'm aware of a number of these types of things happening. Uh, not only with the pistol I was shooting, but also with other manufacturers of pistols. Uh, I'm talking polymer framed striker fired pistols a lot of times. And, you know, I, th I think I would almost rather have been what I was shooting a polymer framed striker fired pistol, because what it does is it blows all that extra or that excess pressure, um, down and out, uh, that usually the, the frame will blow out. Okay. And it's, it's plastic as opposed to like, if it was metal, mm -hmm. I think that could be, I mean, maybe it would hold together better, but I think that could be, you know, greater potential for injury. Um, you know, so anyway, blows out the magazine, blows out the side of the polymer frame and, um, blew out my extractor and it's like, okay, you know, my hands were black and stinging a little bit, but you know, I've seen a number of guys that have had similar experiences and, and, pretty much walked away with the same, same experience as what I had. So, hmm. yeah, it's kind of like with ARs too. Usually when those blow up, they usually blow in a manner that doesn't result in severe injury to the, uh, to the shooter. Just, right. you know, they'll usually blow that pressure out the mag and out the sides of the receiver. And typically you don't have anything really close to, to those. Anyway, guys, <laughs> sorry to make it about me, but 
but just kind of highlighting the fact that I was really glad I had my Range Ruck backpack with my spare pistol in it, uh, you know, nicely transported. I had everything I need with me, all my my mags, Ear Pro, Eye Pro, you know, all, all the typical range gear stuff in my backpack. Pick up a Range Ruck, go to concealedcarry.com forward slash Range Ruck to learn more. All right, let's get to our first story. Matthew, why don't you kick it off here uh, telling us about, I mean, you wrote an article on on california.concealedcarry.com, which is mm-hmm. shared in the show notes today. And folks, if you're newer to the podcast, if you look at the show notes for every episode, any, you know, any of the links or stories or whatever we talk about, you'll see links for those in the show notes, as, long as, as well as links to uh, sponsors and, and those kinds of things as well. Uh, but you wrote this story, California judge rules assault weapon ban violates Second Amendment. And then I may fill in, after you go, I may fill in with a couple of very recent updates on this. Sure, story. sure. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just cover the basic and then you can uh, kind of do the updates here. Um, but just in general, you probably have heard about this. Um, California's had a their assault weapons ban since 1989. Um, and so uh, we have some data as far as uh, how it's working. Um, and so somebody named Miller, James Miller, uh, he teams up with a pro gun group called San Diego gun owners and, um, sues the attorney general of California, uh, in 2019 at the time it was Becerra, like we mentioned earlier, um, stating that the assault weapons ban is banning firearms that are in, are not, um, extraordinarily like extraordinary that are in common use. Uh, many people own them. And so this violates uh, the second amendment and his right to, to have firearms that are in, you know, for general use, uh, whether it be sporting or hunting or um, whatever it might be. And so um, this goes to uh, California um, court and a judge, uh, his last name is Benitez, Roger Benitez. He rules that, Indeed, the uh, California's law is unconstitutional um, and it violates the Second Amendment. And not only did he do that, um, but he made some interesting uh, comments and in, in analogies in his decision, um, which, mm-hmm. yeah, which are like unequivocally stating that this is not, it's, it wasn't like a, you know, a 51% decision here. This was like, unequivocal in his mind. Um, I'll just, you know, if you go to the show notes, pull up his, his decision and, and read it, you'll see it, it's, if you've been in, you know, um, second amendment, you know, rights groups and things and the arguments that are being made, he basically reiterates those eloquently. Um, I w- I would add, but, um, w- one of the, um, comments that stood out to me is he says, this case is about what should be a muscular constitutional right and whether a state can force a gun policy choice that impinges on that right with a 30-year-old failed experiment. And so he's just basically saying like, to overcome the, the constitutional right protected in the second amendment, it should, it, that's a, that's a muscular, like, you know, uh, uh, provision and to overcome that there has to be super compelling evidence or uh proof that this is going to result in public safety overwhelmingly not skept- speculation not you know it may or we think it might it's got to be like overwhelming and he's saying based on a 30 year old w- assault weapons ban that for all intents and purposes and and you know uh research has been done to see if it was effective it proved to be ineffective or any effects were un, uh, you know untraceable uh, right so mm-hmm. um so it's a pretty compelling you, argument you mind if i quote something from there yeah yeah go ahead uh or it, it's actually quoting from a newspaper article but but it's ref- referencing some of the statistics that uh that uh, judge Benitez used and he said it basically says here that half the states with the 10 uh, oh wait, that's that's not it. Hold on. Uh, I had it, but then I scrolled around because I was looking at other things. Here we go. Before the Assault Weapons Control Act, twice in a decade, an assault weapon was used in a mass shooting. On average, since the Assault Weapons Control Act, or AWCA, twice a decade, 
an assault weapon was used in a mass shooting. The assault weapon ban has had no effect. California's experiment is a failure. And that last statement, California's experiment is a failure, is in italics. And it's like that that's exactly how Judge Benitez crafted this, this ruling. Uh, so he's pretty he's putting a lot of emphasis on this. To summarize, the average rate of mass shootings with assault weapons in California has not changed in the 30 years since the assault weapon ban was enacted. I mean, that's pretty damning, to right. be frank. Uh, uh, I mean, just looking at it in the harsh numbers, and I know that doesn't do any justice to victims of these shootings because like those are real people those are real lives and so i understand there's an emotional component to this but things like this assault weapons control act just like a similar ban that existed in the u.s since the mid-90s um that they want to try to bring bring back was all based around that you know this this is this is to reduce mass shootings and the effects of those mass shootings but uh Judge Benitez is pretty, and of course, this what well, he's looking at is specific to California, but California has already had like, and even during this time, not just not just talking about assault, the Assault Weapons Control Act, but they've passed a number of other critical legislative, you know, laws uh, uh, restricting further Second Amendment rights. That again is not seeming to have any effect on the frequency or impact of these mass shootings. And one final thing to throw back to you again is uh, 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 actually my, my brain just went blank. So it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we talk about this all the time and anybody who's listening is probably, you know, nodding their head and saying, yep, we all know this. We all know this. And I think, you know, basically what Benitez is or the judge is trying to say is like you can be for like public safety and be against an assault weapons ban like it, it it's logical to do that right like it's not an outlier like ruby ridge conspiracy theorist you know person uh that th that says okay if, if an assault weapons ban was working maybe i be for it right i'm i'm not saying i am but you you could be for it if you if you say you know it it reduced mass shootings 100% or 90% or whatever right um but you can't be for it on the premise of safety if it if it's not proven to work you could be on it you could be on an assault weapons ban or for uh, an assault weapons ban if you just don't like assault weapons but not if your premise is that banning them will be will make people safer because it, 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 it just isn't. So, um, it, you know, I, we'll see where this goes. You said, um, that you saw it's going to on bonk. So this means like, you know, the, the, the panel of judges are going to look and, and they're going to see, uh, where, what happens next with this. Uh, and by the way, uh, judge Benitez has put in a 30 day, um, hold on, on this order, um, because obviously the attorney general, Bonta uh, filed an appeal on the ruling saying, yeah, yeah like we're, we're appealing this. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it didn't change anything, any law. So if you're in California, you're listening, it, it didn't change anything. It's still status quo is now. Yep. So my updates on this are that, uh, yes, it, it, and it's, you can't even find anything on the uh, ninth circuit courts website. Uh, stating this, but I saw in a uh, YouTube video yesterday from what appeared to me to be a, a credible source with credible information saying that the on banc review has been granted and that the case will be heard, I think on the 22nd or thereabouts of this month, hmm. uh, which is, which is very, very fast. But that's part of the strategy here with, I mean, you know, that judge Benitez knew that this was going to be appealed, right? So we might as well move things along uh, and, and, and get this thing done because chances are it's going to be uh, turned around at the night at the on banc level of, you know, the review of the case uh, by a panel of nine judges. Uh, and so really it's like, let's get this up to the Supreme court while we can, at least, I don't know. I don't know. If that's exactly what judge Benitez is thinking, but that's what I see. Uh, so, and what has been reported so far is that uh, 
the panel of judges has been selected for that on banc review is basically seven of them were appointed by democratic presidents and four by uh or by republican presidents uh so that doesn't look too promising um but i hope that they'll genuinely and intelligently hear the arguments i hope that they will read the words of judge benitez and study those carefully and use sound reasoning and judgment as they hear this case and ultimately make a, a, a ruling on it uh, in review. So we will see. Um, I, I do. F I have found it a little bit humorous, Matthew, in the last week or so that some of the anti-gun, you know, side of of you know people um, and organizations have been losing their ever living mind <laughs> over Judge Benitez's reference to. Uh, how like AR 15s are like Swiss army knives mm -hmm. and they're like, no, they're not like, you gotta be kidding me. And <laughs> you know, like they're losing their mind because they're like, that's, you know, not fair to compare an AR 15 to, you know, a pocket knife. And they're completely like missing the fact or ignoring intentionally or otherwise. Um, the, the, the idea that, that, that I think his point was as utilitarian as a Swiss army knife is, mm -hmm. So is an AR-15, and that right. as is proven by the number of them that are in civilian hands. They are in common use. They are commonly used, and there was references in his ruling to uh, 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 times that they were used successfully in defense. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, he made a he made a very very strong opinion uh, in his uh, favorable ruling on behalf or, or for James Miller, who is mm -hmm. the uh, original plaintiff of the case. Mm -hmm. All right. We need to move along. So there you go. There's your update on uh, the Miller v. Bonta case. Let's go now to Houston, Texas. Is it? Yes. It yes. Is Houston. So the dates have been set for the 2021 NRA annual meeting. Of course, last year's NRA annual meeting was canceled. Uh, and, you know, due to COVID, but uh, it's it's going to happen this year in Houston. Uh, it's actually the 150th year of the organization and its annual meetings. So anyway, um, the dates have been set for September 3rd through September 5th, which is very unfortunate. I think I'll explain why. Uh, it will be held at the George R. Brown Convention Center in Houston. So it's a big, big convention center, 144 acres of show floor, um, tons of exhibitors, obviously. I mean, it's a great show. I enjoy going to the interannual meeting uh, just because you get you get a sense of kind of the pulse or the beat of not just the industry, by that meaning the, the manufacturers and the uh, suppliers that, you know, make everything happen on the, on the manufacturing side of the industry, but also you just get to see and meet. And we've always had a good time meeting, um, meeting fans of ours, I guess, or guardian nation members. Uh, those that listen to the podcast, we've always bumped into to people at the interannual meetings. It's always been a good time. Unfortunately, I am committed to teaching at the primary and secondary training summit, which is that exact same weekend and time frame. So, uh, I will not be able to attend the interannual meetings. Jacob and I were just talking about the other day, like, you know, who, who from our organization would go. Um, not sure yet on what that looks like for us. Um, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at least it's back on. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, it's a positive sign, you know, step in the right direction as far as emerging from this COVID-19 crisis. Right. So let's take a look now at an article from Ammoland.com uh, written by John Crump, a friend of ours. And uh, really, I don't know how we know him, but I, I know John somewhat. Um, ATF uses Operation Southbound to have inspectors carry out warrantless searches. Matthew, what's the gist with this one? So, yeah, so obviously there's a, we, we all know that there's an uh, issue with firearms going across the border into Mexico and the lawlessness is going on in Mexico with the cartels. Uh, and so they're being used uh, by, by criminals over there. Um, and because 
firearms are illegal in Mexico for everybody uh, except you know Mexican drug cartels and police and and all that. Um, so what's happening is the the ATF or the uh, ATF has been working with Mexican police um, at these crime scenes, and the Mexican police are taking crime scene guns taking the serial numbers, handing them over to the ATF and saying, um, investigate where these guns are coming from so we can crack down and see if there's any trends or 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 anything. If you recall, Fast and Furious was kind of, uh, during the Obama administration, was the ATF's uh, you know operation that kind of looked at the guns and where they were going and where they were coming from and how they were getting across the border. And there was a big, big mess about that. But anyways, um, this is similar um, in, in the sense that it's focused on these this, these crime guns or guns that are being used uh, for in crimes in Mexico. So the ATF is in charge of actual criminal investigations uh, for these types of things. There's an office called the Industry Operations Investigations, and these are part of the ATF is uh, go, goes in and does the audits of uh, FFLs and things like that, looks at the books, makes sure they're in compliance, but they're not supposed to be doing investigations, criminal investigations because they have access to the books they're allowed to go into the books without warrants because that's part of the regulatory you know uh process for an ffl um now if the atf wants to do a criminal investigation into um you know uh, uh, some sort of crime or something they need to get warrants to go into in 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 go the the legal route so basically what's happening is the uh, IOI, the, these investigators are going in and being told, um, these are guns that are, we found serial numbers that we found, um, the or Mexican, uh, police have found sent over to us. We want you to check the books of these FFLs and see if you see a trend or see if you see where these are coming, coming from. And then that will be used as evidence for sure in the criminal investigation for them to probably then go get a warrant to search the, you know, the, deeper into the records and books of the FFLs and stuff like that. So this, the concern is, is that the, the, the ATF is basically using the IOI to get into FFLs business with the, in circumventing the, the warrant process. Yeah. It, it's important to note that what IOI investigators uh, do when they when they pay a visit to a dealer, they are there to look at that. Basically, the primary purpose is: did what come in to the dealer get recorded, and did what go out get recorded, and then what hasn't gone out that did come in should still remain on the books, and that dealer should have in possession those items. Like that's the primary purpose. And so what this is doing is changing the scope of that by saying, we want you to be digging a little bit deeper and trying to look for these patterns of which these investigators don't have, you know, these essentially compliance officers, if you will, that they don't have specific training to do so, but they're now being char given the charge as part of this Operation Southbound to look deeper and try to find ident and I find and identify these patterns what those patterns are exactly I don't know but the idea being that they believe guns are being sold by dealers knowingly or unknowingly who knows to specific individuals or organizations that are then immediately going across the border so um I mean, certainly we don't want guns illegally going over the border, right? But it's important, again, to understand that that they're, you know, again, IOI officers or investigators have a specific mandate or charge, which is to look at very specific amounts of paperwork with a specific purpose in mind. And they're being told to now go beyond that, um, that... Uh, at least it appears as though that could be blown out of proportion and potentially used in negative ways against even, you know, like dealers. So 
Um, I don't know. Interesting thing. I shouldn't be surprised. Okay. Especially with the current administration and everything that they're trying to do. In fact, I actually wanted to bring up, it's not, I mean, it is listed in the links to show notes. I added it in there, Matthew, but uh, it basically is titled, uh, you know, we, we should be concerned about this. What it is, is a fact sheet from the White House. This is on whitehouse.gov called National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism. Um, that, that's a little bit of a shift of gears from what we're talking about here with Operation Southbound. But it just it just continues to paint a more complete picture of where the current administration wants to go uh, in their investigatory uh, priorities. Um, specifically, the national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. Guys, you can go check out the link and read it all for yourself. Uh, there's actually like a 32-page document that you can read the whole thing. Um, but this is according to the document, specifically geared towards attacking and countering uh, domestic terrorism and violent extremists and militia groups. And, you know, th this also comes on the heels, actually not on the heels, what comes on the heels of this is Biden actually and his administration pushing for $100 million more in funding for law enforcement agencies uh, in the federal government. Uh, read through this, okay? And guys, just let us know what you think about all this. I, I think that there's some potential, definite, real concern um, in what I was reading through this. Let me, let me give you some examples. Uh, so one thing that they are working on doing is they want to up the level of uh, recognition meaning like facial recognition of people. Uh, and this all stems back to the January 6th storming of the Capitol. Okay. And like, regardless of how you feel about what happened on January 6th. Okay. Um, what concerns me is that we already know the government has all kinds of programs behind the scenes running to track people and information and, already has facial recognition uh, uh, programs and software in place. Basically, they want to spend more money and elevate that in the, the amount of work they're doing to uh, basically find out who you are. Okay. Um, so I don't know. To me, it just feels like it feels kind of icky. It feels really icky, actually, that, uh, that this is such a priority for them. Uh, I think... To be honest with you, my personal opinion is I think things from January 6th were really blown out of proportion. Um, I definitely don't agree with the acts of many people on that day, but I think it was blown out of proportion and they are working really hard to track down people that honestly, I don't think had any malicious intent and didn't believe they were breaking any laws. By that, I know somebody personally that is facing charges as a result of that January 6th thing. And I see it as, I think that he did when, Hey, when you're in a crowd and the crowd is doing one thing, um, you may not even be, any, you may not be a part of any violent activity whatsoever that takes place, but you're just kind of part of this crowd that after the fact sort of wanders in because, Hey, Hey, these guys are doing this and you almost, oh, okay, cool. You know, um, I think a lot of people got uh, tied up in that mess without really understanding fully uh, what it was going to amount to or, or where it was going to lead to, especially from the criminal aspect. But mm -hmm. the federal government's coming down really hard on those that participated, and in some cases, I believe unjustly so. Anyway, just my opinion, and it gives them a great excuse to spend more money to get more into our business as individuals. Mm -hmm. That's all I got to say about that. Let's go to concealedcarry.com article. Matthew wrote one for the good guys. Glock wins important PLCAA civil or court case. Um, so what is the PLCAA? It is the protection of lawful commerce and arms act. Okay. Which has been in place for quite a long time now. And it's an important statute i believe because what it does is it removes it removes liability 
from the maker of a product when somebody uses that product in an unlawful manner. Um, to me, it's just common sense, right? Basically what it is is you got anti-gunners that want to prosecute, want to sue, want to come after gun manufacturers when the gun manufacturers' guns that they have no control of after the fact, right? Like it's obviously assumed that guns are purchased by law-abiding citizens and that they're used in positive ways, right? That's the intent. Like gun manufacturers aren't making guns knowingly like that they're supporting criminal activity. Like that, that doesn't even make sense. So there's no direct tie between manufacturer and criminal on the street using a particular gun manufacturer's gun. And so, um, yeah, basically this removes the ability for someone to sue Glock in the event that somebody did it, you know, committed some act that led to your injury. In this case, this specific case was, I think, an accidental shooting or a negligent discharge mm -hmm. uh, related shooting. Um, but this person wanted to sue Glock for whatever reason because, hey, it's your fault that your gun shot me. Doing, yeah. Probably doing something stupid, frankly, right? Um, why Glock should be on the hook for that is beyond me. Again, I think it's, I think it's common sense. Well, the the law passed in 2005, and other people in 2005 who weren't so uh, hyper partisan or uh, whatever they are now uh, agreed with you because it passed um, Congress uh, 65 to 31 in the Senate and 283 to 144 in the House. So these are pretty good margins, especially when you look at um, the fact that it was protection for firearm manufacturers. I mean, so I think most rational people said, yeah, if, if somebody, you know, bought something and used it illegally, like a, uh, you know, a Ginsu knife, you know, or, and stab somebody, we're not going to go after the, the knife maker. They're making a knife for the purpose of cutting food or whatever it might be. They're not making it to murder somebody. Um, and so most people see that. Um, so, yeah, and, and like you said, this was an accidental shooting. Actually, the Brady campaign uh, brought brought this suit against Glock on, on the behalf of a man who was paralyzed after uh, being shot accidentally with a, with a Glock handgun. So this guy accidentally gets shot. He's paralyzed. Brady campaign says logical next step is to file a suit against the, the, the company that made the gun. I don't know why they didn't include the ammunition manufacturer that might be, you know, the next round. I, I don't know. Like th if, if we're going to go there, we might as well. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. And, you know, the ruling, um, the judge, I'm trying to find her name real quick. Um, her name was Susan Bernovich. Um, and she made uh, a pretty good ruling in this case. I'll just read it real quick so you guys get the gist of it. She said, a fair rating of the PLCAA shows that Congress intended the scope of its preemption to include claims like the plaintiffs. The PLCAA's plain text extends preemption to plaintiffs, tort, and products liability claims. Its unambiguous terms bar any civil cause of action regardless of the underlying theory when a plaintiff's injury results from the criminal or unlawful misuse of the person or or a third party, unless a specified exception applies. So it's pretty cut and dry. I think um, the law speaks for itself and it's kind of strange, but you know, that they even brought it, you no know, understanding this, but this is in conjunction with uh, Joe Biden when he gave the speech April 8th, uh, you know, commenting on gun rights um, or guns specifically, he mentioned the PLCAA specifically and said that that was one of his biggest things that he wanted was um, removal or um, repeal of the PLCAA. That was a huge thing because without the PLCAA, gun manufacturers, I mean, they're, they're, they're done. Every single, anybody who can will bring a suit against gun manufacturers and deplete mm -hmm. them of any, I mean, it, it's, it will happen. And that's, mm -hmm. that's obviously why they want this repealed. So important law, important decision too. Yeah. Spot on in that regard. And that is exactly why this is important. 
I know there's certainly people that that there may even be some gun owning folk that think a law like this is ridiculous, but we have to recognize the the fact that just like what you said, if if gun manufacturers can be held liable for criminal acts that occur with the use of their products, uh, the floodgates will open. And it, that that is its own form of an attack on Second Amendment because mm-hmm. there will be companies that will be sued out of existence. And your ability to purchase and buy and own guns that you want to, that you have a right to, uh, will be hampered. So just keep that in mind. Let's go now to a new product release from Mossberg. A couple of years, I think two years ago. Uh, yep. Yeah, Mossberg came out with their first pistol in like 100 years. Because keep in mind, if you didn't know, they, they actually did manufacture handguns once upon a time, way back in the day. Since then, they've been known more for their shotguns than anything. A little bit of hunting rifles, but mostly shotguns. And then two years ago, surprised the industry by coming out with the MC1SC pistol, uh, which is a which was essentially a their answer to the subcompact or microcompact single stack market. Ironically enough, or interestingly enough, they come out with that around the time that microcompact pistols that are double stack are were, were becoming the the new thing and are the the thing right like everybody's jumping on that bandwagon since sig blew up the market with the p365 so you have smith and wesson with the with a revamped shield you've got uh glocks with the 43x and 48 you've got and grand those are a little bit bigger but but still similar concept uh, you've got, uh, what am I missing, Matthew? The Taurus has come out with the GX4. Uh, uh, the Hellcat from Springfield Armory, obviously, you know, has taken off pretty fast. It's pretty popular. So that's where the market is. And now, two years later, Mossberg releases, this is, this is the big news, the MC2C, <laughs> which is a slightly larger big, or version of the MC1SC. It's got a slightly longer barrel. Because uh, I think the MC1SC was a 3.4 inch barrel. The MC2C, man, they should come up with a better name. <laughs> it's getting really co- like there's a, there's a logic behind it. I understand that, but it's a little bit challenging sometimes to remember and, and also to say. But the MC2C has a 3.9 inch barrel, so half inch longer barrel. The grip length is also quite a bit longer. Uh, well, it's like a half or 0.6 inches longer than the MC1. C S C um and it has a standard 13 round capacity with a flush fitting mag and a 15 round extended mag option available. Uh here's the thing. When I first saw the release on this Matthew, I was like, oh, so finally they're ju- jumping on the P365 bandwagon. And then I realized the barrel was a little bit longer, uh, which you know, okay, so it's more like the four, P365 p365 xl or the glock 48 then i look at it a little bit more and yeah okay the grip length is a bit longer but here's the thing the gun is 1.1 inches wide which it's a bit chunky compared to the glock 43 x 48 the the p365 p365 xl the even the taurus gx4 like all of those are basically one inch or sub one inch guns Meaning that in most cases, they're like a one inch grip or frame and the slides quite often is like 0.9 inches. This one is, it's a, it's a, I mean, you may not think that 0.1 inches sounds like a lot, but keep in mind that a standard Glock 17, Glock 19 is like 1.1 or 1.2 inches. So this is, this is a bit fatter, a bit bigger than some of the, it, it probably is a little bit closer to like a Glock 48 in size, which again is a little bit more on the chunky. I like that word, chunky size compared to like the the Hellcat and the P365XL and stuff like that. So, uh, 13 round gun, 15 round extendable, 3.9 inch barrel. Uh, it is 7.1 inches total length, 4.9 inches high. Okay, and again, 1.1 inches wide. Weighs 21 ounces unloaded. 
now comparing again to the MC1 SC, which is 19 ounces unloaded, again doesn't seem like a big difference. But again, the M MC1 SC is basically is, is, is a one inch wide gun, uh, 4.3 inches long or high, and 6.25 inches long. So quite quite a bit smaller. And it may not seem like that much just looking at the numbers, but I promise if you put these in your hands, uh, it, it you will notice a pretty substantial difference. Um, one final thing I'd throw out there, Matthew, is oh, and the MSRP is $505 on the MC2 SC or MC2C. Compare that to $435 on the MC1SC, hmm. the more compact version. And the other final thing is, is that they did not listen to me at SHOT Show two years ago when I held the MC1SC and said, guys, you need to work on your grip texture or stippling because it's really dumb. And arguably the grip texture on the MC2C is even dumber because <laughs> it basically continues the exact same type of texture design as the MC1 SC, but it's got a longer grip. So you end up with this big, wide, flat, untextured space that is where the meaty part of your palm, especially your support hand palm needs to interface with the gun and get good grip contact. You, this is, this is a gun designed by somebody that, I mean, okay, it's got some cool other features. Nice trigger. It's got pretty decent serrations on the slide, forward serrations. It's got a unique takedown mechanism that, you know, you lock the slide to the rear and the, and the, and the uh, cover plate on the back of the slide, you, you slide off. It's got a little button and, and, you know, it's like, it's got kind of some unique things about it, but they are really dumb in how they've put texture on the grip of this gun. And I view that as, Somebody who doesn't really know how to shoot designed this thing. And I think that's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'll add um, is it will come with a safety version that you'll probably not want to get because this has a cross bolt safety that is if, if you're not, if you don't see the picture, if, you know, if you're not logged in or, or um, following the show notes and go to their website, um, imagine this above the safety or the uh, magazine release button, go up just a little bit on the, on the grip and put a cross bolt safety that pushes in on, uh, on the left-hand side uh, to take it off safe and from the right to put it back mm -hmm. on safe, almost like inevitably where your hand may fall or go to with many different types of common grips or even like in, in, in you know, a one handed, you know, uh, compromised position gripping the gun or something like that. Or it's just, it's a, I, I can't imagine it's it, it, that they put much, they, they got people that were using this in a self-defense context or anything thinking that way and said, does this work? And they said, yep, this is a great idea. I just can't like, it's just not a great idea. So in my, in my estimation, maybe somebody will like it. I, I'm not yeah. sure, but. Yep. Yeah. And, and that is an optional feature. So like, right, right, if right. you look at their models lineup, there's basically, you know, two options. Uh, well, there's a couple options, but there's, when we're talking about the safety, you get the non manual safety version and you can get the manual safety version. Um, I do think it's a safety. I mean, obviously, it's unique in its approach. Uh, it is a cross bolt type safety. So, if you're familiar with how you know cross bolt safeties work and have worked for years and years on things like shotguns and some rifles and you know 22 rifles and things like that, that's basically the concept here. It, I do think that, especially for a right-handed shooter, because my understanding is the manual safety is not reversible. Um, and my understanding is that for a right-handed shooter, you would push and you can, and I tested this on the MC one SC two years ago when we first saw it. Uh, I haven't handled one since then, by the way, but uh, um, the uh, you, you can hit that safety with your index finger before you go to put your finger in the trigger or on the trigger. Uh, and, you know, I think that could be learned for a shooter to where it's somewhat intuitive. Um, but if you're a lefty, it's a whole other thing. Okay. Uh, you'd have to use the thumb or something on your support hand to, to uh, activate the safety, to, to, to or really deactivate the safety. It's a unique approach. One I'm not particularly keen on. I'd probably go with the non-safety model if I was interested in one, which I'm not particularly. I just don't see this pistol as 
filling any particular need that isn't already met by other options on the market that I prefer. Uh, I'm sure I will see this gun at SHOT Show this year, assuming it happens, which looks like it will, and we'll shoot it and we'll say, yeah, okay, it's a small subcompact or compact pistol that shoots fine and has an okay trigger. Okay, what else does it do for me? The other the thing here is that keep in mind that Mossberg is new coming back into the pistol making game. Um, but they are way behind the ball because they were like seven years late coming out the MC1 SC. Uh, they're a couple years late coming out with this MC2C, meaning the rest of the market's already ahead of them. And by that, even further, I mean they don't have an optics ready version, which I think is a shame like pretty much every other ma major manufacturer is doing. Speaking of which, it's a good segue into our next new gun release, one from Rock Island Armory, and this one is optics ready. Matthew, tell us about the STK100 from Rock Island. Yeah, the cool thing or the interesting thing, Rock Island Armory is known for their 1911 pistols. They haven't produce any striker fired guns and this will be the first uh striker fired handgun um it's similar in size to like a glock 17 it's going to have a 17 round uh, capacity uh barrels four and a half inches and it's just under 7.9 inches in overall length um and to your point riley about the overall width this is 1.25 um it is optics ready. The cool thing, and uh, you know, we posted this on Facebook, and, and there were a lot of comments about like, "Oh, it's just a Glock wannabe. It's another Glock." It's actually not really. Be the 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 it may look like a Glock. It has a slot, uh, uh, ba basic uh, slide serrations, um, but it also has uh, ports cut in into the slide, lightning cuts that lighten up the slide a little bit. Um, it it may look like a Glock, but it's not. the The frame is aluminum which obviously a Glock is, is polymer. So this has an aluminum frame, so it's going to be a little bit heavier. And some people prefer that, you know, if you shoot um, CZs or something uh, or 1911s th th in like that, you know, um, heavier grip, you know, you, you'll probably be inclined to like this. Um, it has the same supposed grip angle as a 1911 um, and a big, you know, pronounced beaver tail in the back it sort of looks like, I mean, you know, kind of looks similar. If you just kind of look, glance at it, the grip shape a little bit like a, like a 1911 with that, with that big beaver tail. Um, and it lends to a pretty good undercut underneath the, the, the trigger guard. Um, but we'll see the, the grip texture looks pretty decent on the sides. I'm not so sure about the back or, or the front. Um, but like I said, I haven't gotten this in my hands. I don't know. Um, but just looking from the couple pictures, it looks like it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and it'd be cool to shoot it at shot show and see what it, see what it does. Yeah. I mean, what's notable about this? It's, uh, it's, a, it's the first striker, striker fired pistol from rock Island and army. Everything else they've done has been hammer fired. Uh, it is based around the, the Glock design, okay? I, you said it wasn't a Glock, but I would not be surprised one bit. I haven't seen any internal pictures of the frame or slide, uh, but uh, I'm willing to bet that internally it looks very much like a Glock, maybe with a few slight changes, but uh, it basically looks... I mean, keep so it's got the same takedown mechanism, it's got the same pin locations where like the trigger pin and the frame, you know, the locking block pin uh, that, that locks the, what's called the, literally the locking block on the uh, Glock pistols in place. Uh, it's got the rear pin in pretty much the same position. Looks maybe a little bit different there, but it could be because the profile of this grips a little bit fatter front to back. Um, it does look like it has decent, grip texture uh these diagonal cuts on the kind of rear what i would call the rear quarter panels of the grip uh probably are pretty you know fairly effective uh you know and the side texture is really solid from what i can see not a whole lot going on in the front a couple little lines if you will uh horizontal lines um but you know aluminum framed glock pistol is basically how i view this it, that is optics ready so so that's, you know, hey, that's a good start. 
Um, it looks cool. I'll give them that. Um, not sure like how crazy or innovative it is, you know, considering that I'm again fairly certain that they're just borrowing from e- expired patent Glock design at mm-hmm. this point, which is basically like Glock or Gen 3 Glock, just like a number of other companies out there are essentially doing. I mean, you've got Palmetto State Armory that has come out with their little striker fired pistol that's that's basically a Gen 3 Glock type design. So but they have a but the aluminum frame they made the slide serrations and cuts which is good um i mean it, you see yeah i mean all that though like honestly like some design team is sitting in their office and they're like what should we do to make this thing stand out and different well we could add some cuts and stuff like that well i yeah. think the slide serrations are like good for grip oh like, yeah i mean there's no, no doubt about that you know so but even Glock now is finally getting on board. Finally, with, you know yeah. more forward serrations and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in the aluminum, I mean that is the other thing, right? Yeah, to your point, the aluminum frame is unique. There's not really anybody else out there doing that. You have a few companies that are making aluminum frames for Sig pistols, like the P320 and the P365. We're really making grip modules, um, you know, and some people will appreciate that. Uh, Rock Island Armory's claim is that that'll make it more accurate. Um, maybe, maybe not. Because when you look at it, really what matters with pistol accuracy is consistency of lockup between the barrel and the slide. That that's That's what determines where that bullet goes, is how well and how consistently the barrel locks up to the slide every time the gun cycles and and the slide of course is attached to sights or sights are attached to the slide. So that's where, you know, that's your aiming device. So it's all about that lockup. Now, can the frame have some influence over how consistently that lockup can occur? Yeah, probably. Um, is it practical? I can guarantee you any accuracy improvements that this design <laughs> offers are so minimal that it's probably not practical. And gen five clocks are plenty accurate on their own. Any, honestly, any clocks, generally accurate enough but the gen 5s honestly are pretty accurate anyway uh let's move on to i mean it's always cool to see new things coming out from uh you know gun manufacturers yeah sorry i had a call coming in there and making ringing my computer here making noise (laughs) nordstrom stores to ban ccw nationwide uh this from firearmsnews.com basically they got their hands on a um uh, a statement that was sent out to Nordstrom store employees uh, very recently. And the statement, in fact, I'll just read it. Cause I think it's just really telling about kind of their attitude on things. I'll, I'll skip a couple of parts of it, but it says, except for authorized law enforcement, we firmly believe that there's no place for guns in our stores. We're going to be more directly letting our customers know that they're not allowed to bring guns into stores. We'll do this by posting front of house signage that explains our no guns in store policy. While the signs will make this policy more visible, this is not a major shift from our previous approach. In the past, if we saw a customer carrying a store in our a gun in our store, we'd ask them to remove it. We will continue doing that. Only now we'll have a more clearly written policy. All U.S. stores will receive this signage along with talking points, FAQs, and training resources for store managers to help support conversations with customers. Signs should be posted on June 14th, 2021. Um, More than anything, we want to ensure you feel safe and comfortable at work. We think this shift will help everyone feel safe when, and then that was the extent of the screenshot that Firearms News was able to obtain. So what I find interesting about this, Matthew, is like, okay, on the one hand, they're a private corporation, uh, meaning, you know, it's their store, their policies, their property or whatever. Um, They can make up rules. That's fine. Cool. You know, depending on the state that you are in will determine the degree of, of, of of how enforcing that can be. Um, whether you know some of you will go okay as long as it stays concealed no big deal to me okay whatever right um some of you might need to be a little bit more careful with that depending on your state 
But here's what I find interesting, Matthew, is that they say that they're providing support and resources for store managers to help support conversations with customers. So their their policy will be if we see or become aware of somebody carrying a gun, then presumably a manager of some kind will be expected to approach that customer and engage in conversation with them about their gun and the fact that it shouldn't be or that it's not allowed in the store. I just I think that's I I they say that their focus here is, or priority is for their employees to feel safe and comfortable at work. To me that's like the a backwards approach like in, expecting your store employees to to approach and talk to somebody that has a gun I think it just opens up the possibility for more issues uh, and, and a greater security issue. Uh, the fact is, if somebody has a gun and comes into your store, uh, chances are, hey, look at their body language. Like, what are they doing? Are they there to hold up your store? You, chances are you'll figure that out pretty quick. Oh, this guy just is tagging along with his wife as she's roaming the clothing racks, you know, or whatever. Like, um, okay, guess what? He's probably not there to hurt you. And his gun's sitting there in a holster. It's not hurting anybody. But now we start confronting people about it and emotions can run high. Folks, be responsible out there. And if you ever are confronted about the gun you're carrying, be wise stewards. That's, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what's your thoughts on this, Matthew? Yeah, just just what, what I thought was interesting was the end where it says, um, we think this shift will help everyone feel safe. And here's the thing, like, yeah, you might feel safe, right? Like people can feel safe, but not actually be safe. And there's a whole big difference between, mm -hmm. oh, I feel like I'm safe. I'm, you know, I, I might be just about to get robbed walking down the street with my dog and I feel super safe, but somebody might be coming up behind me to, and, and about to shoot me. So like, just because you feel safe, I, I think th this exposes the prime uh, difference or ideological difference or the, the reason why like the two sides can't talk because it's, there's a feeling of that. If I'm around a gun, I'm unsafe. If somebody has a gun, even if they're not a dangerous person that they they might be even be somebody, you know, and kind of, you know, like, but if you're around that person, you're not safe. Whereas people that use firearms or train or, or have an understanding of firearms, they see a firearm and they say, you know, I may not have my firearm with me, but if somebody comes in here and starts shooting the place, I'm actually safer next to this dude I know that has a firearm, right? Who isn't here to shoot up. So I think it's a fundamental difference. They just feel unsafe if they see a gun. Um, they don't want to actually be safe. They just want to feel safe. And that's good enough for them. Um, so uh, we'll see where that goes, but yeah. Interesting point from Elke on Facebook comments, uh, saying that it's ironic because employees will confront a person carrying a firearm, but they are prevented like many retailers like Walgreens, for instance, there's a recent uh, video that's been roaming the internet of a pretty interesting situation, uh, from a Walgreens from confronting shoplifters due to the potential for confrontation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that is kind of ironic. Yep. Like one case where an actual crime is being committed. Now, I'm not saying you should confront or shouldn't confront shoplifters. That, that's uh, I, I don't even work in that space. Couldn't care less. That's up to you know your company. Uh, you know, assuming somebody out that is listening, you know, works for a retail business or a business that's open and has a potential for people coming in and stealing stuff. Like that's up for you to figure out. But uh, yeah, I mean. One case where an actual crime is being committed, and another case where most likely it's a permitted concealed carrier just minding his own business or her. Okay, uh, one final story, and we need to uh, get to our, our gear reviews. We're running out of time. Gun industry improves background checks, yielding meaningful results. Uh, Matthew, what's this all about? So, ammoland.com, uh, the story. Um, Basically, uh, the um, FBI NICS system uh, is only as good as the information that's in it, right? Like you, we can debate if we should have it or not, but 
that's currently what we have, the NIC system or the background check uh, system, the information that goes in that says, hey, this person is can't buy the firearm or this person is allowed to proceed to buy the firearm. Um, there's certain information that goes into that system. Um, it says the NSSF has achieved 270% increase in the number of submitted adjudicated mental health records. Um, these are the ones that are adjudicated mental health issues um, and prohibited from uh, buying a firearm. So a 270% increase um, of uh, records being submitted. So this is as of December 31st, uh, 2020. Now, this goes in, this is part of that um, bipartisan uh, law that was uh, signed by Donald Trump uh, called Fix Nix. And this was supposedly, th this was supposedly a push to try to get um, the correct information into the system and then kind of encourage uh, agencies because the federal government can't uh, compel the agencies to put medical information uh, i.e., you know, the, these mental health issues into the, the NIC system. So this kind of uh, was saying, hey, look, we're trying to get this system so it's actually worthwhile. If we have a system that has incomplete records or some people aren't entering them, it's it's really not that effective uh, to, to what we want. So they got these, uh, you know, more um, information to be put in, more accurate information up to date. And the NSSF said that... Um, uh, 16 states have passed laws increasing the number of prohibited mental health records to uh, FBI, the NIC system. So now this is seen if, through the, in the article, it says um, meaning, yielding meaningful results. And this, I mean, the meaningful results is depending on how you look at the NIC system. If you think it's an important system or it should be there, then yes, this is meaningful to have actual accurate accurate records if you don't think that the nick system is viable and or shouldn't be around at all then this is something that you're like well i don't care this is even worse because now we're you know putting more information in here and um so i you know depending on where you are where you fall um you might see this as a good thing or a not so good thing i guess mm -hmm. yep uh I don't have an opinion on this. Uh, I think that what I'd like to end with, at least covering these industry news stories, is, folks, you tell us. Why don't you tell us what you think about about all this? Uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, I can see what the industry, in this case, an NSSF, so the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Uh, which is a big organization that represents pretty much all of your major manufacturers in this industry. Um, you know, that they are, I mean, that is an industry led campaign to get better and more accurate and more mental health information into the NICS system. I think industry led efforts are probably better than government led ones. However, whether this is the right one or not, I don't know. That's up for you to decide. Um, on the one hand, we don't want crazy people with guns. On the other hand, we got to be, you know, careful. I think with the information that's handed over to the government. So I don't know. I I, I don't really have a particularly strong opinion one way or another. Uh, as long as the information is sound and is respected and is accurate, um, I don't have much of an opinion. Yeah. Let's get to our gear reviews. I'll go first, Matthew. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm going to review the... I'm getting things uh, ready here. I uh, thought I had a like a sticker here that I'd hold up. But anyway, I'm reviewing the Go Fast, Don't Suck <laughs> Dry Fire Decals. Um, ben Steger Pro Shop also sells a similar type product. Uh, a little bit different, I think. I think they more sell like actual cardboard printed targets. These are actual decals that are reusable and these are really cool so go fast don't suck i mean it's probably a, a company name that you're more familiar with if you're a competitive shooter because you'll see them around bill duda is the man in charge over there at uh, go fast don't suck um lots of different dry fire decal options on that site 
uh, whether you want something that's USPSA focused, IDPA focused, if you want some, uh, if you want a mix of USPSA style as well as IPSC style targets, um, lots of options for dry fire targets on gofastdontsuck.com or gofastdontsuck.net, I think actually is the yes. website name. Yeah. Um, what these are is they are, it's kind of hard to explain. They're not, they're not straight up like, uh, vinyl stickers. Like they've got like a fiber reinforcing to them. Um, here we go. Fine. Got an edge here, but like you peel these off this backer and it has a reusable, uh, adhesive on the backs of these, meaning that you can pretty much use them indefinitely or near indefinitely so you get this and it looks like a sticker sheet and you peel these off and then you can stick them up on your walls so you can reposition them you can move them around you can change things up you can pack them up take them on the go uh when i first used these was at home about a week before i went to area to area six championship um and then i i took them with me because this particular set, I, I got the USPSA Mega Pack, which is, I don't know, probably eight pages or so of these decals. Um, it's a bunch of different targets. You get you know, one third scale, one fourth scale, one sixth scale, um, USPSA targets, targets with hard cover on them. Um, that's the black painted end zone. Um, you know, no shoot targets, head only targets, steel targets, popper, popper targets. I mean, here's a sheet that has. You can see, right? Like, here, here's a couple of just round, steel, you, you know, targets you could use for, to represent steel targets. Here's a steel popper target. Here's a USPSA no shoot target, right? Here's one that's got a a, a a hard cover area. Okay, so lots of really great options in this USPSA Mega Pack. Really, really impressed. Not inexpensive. I what did I pay? Like, I don't know. If I had to look it up. Uh, I think I got it right here. The USPSA Mega Packs thirty dollars. So you you might go, whoa, that's thirty bucks of like basically what amounts to be in stickers. But these are again like fiber reinforced reusable decals. Um, that again, like I, I took them to North Carolina with me, uh, used them in my hotel room for dry fire. Uh, you know, peeled a couple of these off, stuck them up on the walls, did dry fire right there in the hotel room, in a safe manner, of course. Uh, in preparation for Area 6. And then when I was time to check out of the hotel, peeled them off the wall, stuck them back on these decals. Um, I literally took these down off my wall to put them on the sheet so I could show you. And they'll come right back off and, and stick again. So really, really cool approach to a uh, dry fire target um, product like this. I, I, I can't recommend the go fast, don't suck dry fire decal targets enough so yeah, neat man to be fair we have a bunch of free to print targets and things on our website concealedcarry.com forward slash print targets and that's what i've used for a long time um and we'll probably continue to use uh and by that i mean for dry fire purposes expressly uh, i probably will continue to do so but i i will be using these go fast don't suck ones as well so uh, i'm just mentioning that because hey if, if you're if you're not up to paying money to have some fancy stickers uh, to put targets up on your walls. Like, okay, cool. Go print some off of our website. Um, but these are really, really cool, high quality um, products. It looks neat, man. Cool. Um, so my review is going to be uh, the foundation belt from EDC belt company. Uh, I got this uh, man, maybe a month ago and I've been wearing it exclusively. So I like, um, it's about low, time, bro. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so I like low profile belts. Um, you know, ones that don't have a big belt buckle on the front, especially if you carry appendix and that, that you, you end up putting the belt buckle on the side. Um, and I'm, I don't know if it's from, you know, Marine Corps trying to keep the gig line straight and everything, but it, it just bothers me a little bit. Um, and <laughs> then if you put that in the front, you compound, you know, carrying a firearm and then put a belt. It it just draws like some unnecessary attention to that area. So the EDC belt, um, the uh, foundation belt is a low profile belt. It's It has Velcro um, in this um uh, metal metal buckle. That's all it is. It just passes through like a loop, passes through uh, Velcro loops on itself. The thing about this, and I have this 
low profile belt, which is basically the same thing. This has a plastic buckle um, or loop um, from Blue Alpha Gear. This is their low profile belt. The difference, and I love this belt, but the difference between this is this is hard nylon webbing throughout the entire length of the belt. Um, the foundation belt um, is hard on the sides um, and the front where you would carry the firearm where it would need to be reinforced. And in the back, it's soft. So it, it, it's reinforced in certain areas and in the back it's soft. And if you think, if you take off like an old belt that you've been wearing for a long time, like a leather belt, you'll see that it actually bows because, you know, as it wraps around your body. So in that middle, it kind of bows. And I think that the concept here is that this gives a little bit of flex in the backs for that bowing to occur without actually causing um, as much, you know, uh, twisting of the, the hard belt but still gives you the uh, reinforcement of the hard nylon webbing that you need if you're going to carry a firearm. Um, and so I like, I, I you know, I, I've been used to this belt. Um, I really, really like the fact that this is just a comfortable belt and, and I, I really like it. The quality is really good. The stitching and, and everything seems really, uh, really on point and the metal buckle, you know, it, it looks nice. Um, and like I said, I've been wearing it for a month pretty much as my everyday belt and I love it. it it's holding up really well. Um, and yeah, I, sorry, there's not really a, a free version, like the free printout targets. I guess you could use a shoestring. That would be your free version, but you need a good belt for, for, um, uh, if you're going to carry a firearm, you, you need a, a decent belt. That's not going to break down. Um, so the EDC belt company foundation belt, it's on, we sell it uh, on the in, in the concealed carry store, um, but definitely worth it. I would just recommend if you are like any belt, um, get it a couple sizes up. You know, uh, make sure that you, you you add it like an inch or two to whatever your your waist size is. Um, so, yeah, I, I I highly recommend it. Absolutely, you know, I'm a big fan. I've been wearing one for. I don't know. I have to go back and look and see how long it's been, but it is my EDC belt of choice. Now it has been for a good while. Like I don't remember the last time I used a different belt. So excellent choice, Matthew. Well done. Awesome. Yeah. The, the thing I like to say to people and, and they probably don't quite understand exactly what I mean when I say it, but re regarding the EDC belt company foundation belt, it's stiff where you need it, not where you don't. <laughs> yep. That's the truth. <laughs> so guys that brings us here close to the end we do have a weekly podcast giveaway winner to announce we do this once a week uh and the uh the, the entry runs from what monday to monday or yes sir monday to monday uh you need to go to concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize to make sure you're signed up each week for a chance to win free swag and gear from us uh, this week, we're giving away a free SWAT T tourniquet to one lucky winner. I'll have Matthew announce that winner in just a moment. Uh, but uh, next week, we will be giving away a $50 gift certificate to SSP Eyewear. So uh, that's that's pre pretty good. And I'll tell you, 50 bucks goes a long way on SSP Eyewear's website. And they make yeah. good quality but affordable stuff. Mm -hmm. So, Matthew, who is our lucky winner this week for the SWAT T? Here's drum roll. Scott M, you are you won the SWAT T. We will send you out one. Scott M, uh, look in your mail, your email. We'll get one out to you. Scott M, congratulations. Congrats on winning a SWAT T, and we will see you back here next week to see who the lucky winner is of a $50 gift certificate to SSP Eyewear. Don't forget again, go sign up at concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize. So with that, it's time to say goodbye, bid you adieu, take care, be safe. If we don't see you, now we do have one more episode coming up here in about an hour. Special guest, by the way, with uh, Haney McMood, a uh, great instructor out of, uh, out of Texas. He's actually going to be an instructor at the 2021 Guardian Conference. So look forward to that interview with Haney here in just a little bit. Um, but until next time. Again, if we don't see you until then, happy Father's Day. Have a great weekend. And until then, train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care.